No one was harmed in the filming of this sequence. The shit you and your friends do in a pub is what I do and somehow get paid for it. That's my natural hairline there now. Comedians are, yeah, we're very judgmental. I don't really think that the American people are more polarized now than they were 10 years ago. How are you? And welcome to another episode of The Delve. I'm Mike Sheridan and my guest today is Sona Mosesian. Sona has been Conan O'Brien's assistant for well over a decade at this point and regularly appeared on screen in the different iterations of his show. Whenever she did appear, the clips would routinely go viral, mainly because Sona is both naturally hilarious and truly authentic. Sona appears alongside Conan and Matt Gorley regularly on the great podcast, Conan O'Brien is a Friend. And she's written a book, The World's Worst Assistant. I love that pod and I really can't recommend the book enough. I read a lot of books as research for people I'm interviewing and Sona's was a breath of fresh air. It's honest and insightful and again, very funny. Check it out wherever you get your books. It's out now. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. If you're listening as a pod, leave a review. Or if you're watching, smash that subscribe button as the kids say and leave a comment. Enjoy the conversation with Sona. How are you doing? How are you on tour at the moment for the book or are you done? No, I'm done. I did a, uh, I've been doing, I've still been doing press. Luckily, a lot of it I could do from home. So on the phone interviews, uh, I went to San Diego for a book event. I'm going to Portland. And then I did a three day book event where I, uh, went to Seattle. I did one in LA and then I did one in, uh, in San Francisco. And so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it, it, I think it's like, I think the travel's winding down a bit now. So I'm really happy about that. Cause like I have two boys, it's hard to leave, you know? Yeah, I can imagine where you, you weren't away for too long, right? No, I've never gone for more than a night. And how do you find it a center of attention now? Is it a bit strange? Obviously it's your book, it's your life. Yeah, it's, it hasn't changed that much. I think it's funny. It's, it's just, I don't know. Everything just kind of feels the same. I, I thought that things would feel different after having written a book, but again, I, I thought things would feel different when Conan put me in his YouTube videos, or if he put me on the podcast and nothing really feels different. It's all kind of just the same still. So I don't know. I, I think Everything's just the same. I wish it was more exciting. I wish I suddenly felt more glamorous and cool, but I don't. <laughs> well, you've, well, you've been doing the live shows and stuff for a while as well, right? So you've been on, you've been kind of, kind of coming in and out of show for ages. And then you did the live shows recently in front of thousands of people. So it's not like you were up just behind the scenes all the time. And then all of a sudden you were, you were front and center. No, no. And I'll tell you the good part about it too, is that the podcast is called Conan O'Brien needs a friend. So if I'm terrible, I'm not Conan O'Brien. He's the one who suffers because of it. <laughs> He's the one who really has, you know, the stakes. The stakes are high for him, but for me, they're not. It's not Sodom Obsessia needs a friend. It's Conan O'Brien needs a friend. So if I'm terrible, you know, that's on him. <laughs> so that's, I think the fact that there really are no stakes for me, if I'm good or if I'm bad, then it kind of eases, eases the tension a bit. It makes it a little easier for me. I'd be a bit like that as well. There's a lot to be said for lowered expectations. You can only yes. exceed them then. What did Conan say when you told him you were writing the book? Because obviously you, you have to get the nod from him before you can write the book, given what it's about. Yeah, I know. And I still work for him. So of course it's, you know, I can't, I can't write. A, I think that when I first told him I had the idea for the book, I thought uh, he's either going to hate this or he's going to think it's great. And luckily he not only thought it was great, but he was super supportive. So he's like, I'm going to write the foreword and I'm going to, you know, get you in touch with some people who can help you get the book made. And, and it was really, really nice. I don't think, I mean, not, I don't think the book would not have been written or even been sold if it wasn't for him. So I, I have him to thank for it. And the thing is, I think, both of us thought, oh, am I going to make him look bad? Is this going to be like, you know, am I going to write this book and he's just going to come off looking terribly? And then as I was writing the book, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm just making myself look horrible. And he <laughs> looks great. And it's the complete opposite of what I 
thought would happen and what I intended to happen. <laughs> so I think, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it, it definitely, what I thought the book would be and what it eventually turned out were completely different. Not that he's a terrible boss, but I thought, oh, <laughs> if I tell people he makes fun of me so much, then I'll be more sympathetic. But then I wrote about all the things that I do and I realized, no, I'm just, I look terrible. I'm just a really bad employee and he looks great in comparison. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, you got to write a book and you're so popular on the podcast as well. I know Andy Richter said this to you too. You just, you've come across very authentically. So you come across like almost like, not that you don't give a shit, but that you're not phased by any of the fame or anything that might come from, but like you're not seeking it. No, I'm not seeking it. I know pe people have asked me uh, throughout the course of my time working for Conan, they've, they've been asking me what my, what I would do next, you know, thinking, uh, do I want to be on camera? Do I want to have my own show? And I don't, I, I don't want to do any of that. I don't want to be in, that was never my intention was my intention was never to be in the public eye. It was, uh, it was just to have a lot of fun at work, which is what's happened. And I think nothing makes you not want to be on camera more than seeing someone who has to be on camera all the time and working for someone like that. Cause the pressure on Conan was always just so much. And I think you have to just be built differently. And he's, he's built a very specific way. He's such a workhorse. And I don't know if it's an Irish thing, but you know, it's, he just constantly has to keep working and he constantly has to just keep doing things. And, and I'm not like that. I'm happy to just sit and do nothing for weeks. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, uh, I think that comes across crosses that, you know, as fun as this is, I, I don't need it. It's fun, but it it's not like it's what I had wanted. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be an actress. I don't want to be a comedian. So I, I hope what comes off is, is that I'm genuinely just having fun because that really is what I feel. And also if you get to like work from home and the capacity that like we're both in, I'm not sure what room or your house, you know, I'm in my spare room. That's where I do the show from. <laughs> it's like ridiculously convenient to come in and, and have a setup here now, especially after the past couple of years, it's, it's kind of seen as okay for this to be broadcastable. I know new. exactly. Which is great probably for you. And for, it was great for us. Cause we would, it was the only way you could keep things going when everything was shut down was that just to do something remotely. It's, it's very different. Of course, when somebody is in the room with you and it's actually, I, I think that, you know, if I could have, I would have just flown to Ireland and just hung out with you and done this and then come back. Um, but this is a really good way to just connect with people. I mean, I can't believe I'm talking to, to you and you have a podcast and you're in Ireland, right? Like, isn't that amazing? I think that's just so incredible. I'm always like, there's always moments where I'm just like, wow, I can't believe you get to do these things. Look at technology. I'm like, a, I'm like my mother. Uh, the, the entertainment industry hasn't beaten you down yet anyway, Sana. Not yet. It hasn't. And I don't think it will. I know. I, I, at this point, if it hasn't by now, it's not going to, it's been, geez, I've been working in entertainment and television for like 15 years. So I think if it hasn't gotten me or beaten me down yet, it's just not going to, I think I beat it. I think yeah. I beat the television industry. <laughs> it sounds like you did. Uh, I'm, I'm about <laughs> I'm about halfway through the book now. I'm listening to the audio version of the book. You're just telling Conan. I'm really enjoying it. And you're just telling Conan about your bad relationship experiences. So I'm gonna I'm gonna finish it over the weekend. Uh, but I think I think we're it's similar in some ways because I I obviously interview people for a living. I'm a, I'm a journalist as well, and that I've been on the peripheral of so many celebrities and so many really really famous people. Now I think I kind of have an idea what people are like and what people aren't like. But yeah. in actuality, it's my friends who work in the movie studios, who work in PR or work as publicists, who are able to like tell me what it's actually like behind the scenes, what these people are actually like. Yeah. Is it, it, you've been on the peripheral of these type of people on a massive scale for so many years now. And what, is it just second nature to you now or you still get a little bit? Uh, oh, I'm always... I'm always starstruck. Do you still get starstruck, Mike? Or is that just kind of... It, it depends who it is. Like, I've I've done this a lot. But for, for some reason, I had Jake Tapper on the show a couple of years back. And I just brain farted talking to Jake. My girlfriend is my camera person. <laughs> She's laughing at me. I just brain farted talking to Jake Tapper. I don't know what happened. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Cause he's awesome. I love Jake Tapper. I mean, I get it. Cause I think I, so when I first started in, t- in TV, someone said, don't ever get jaded. So there's never been a part of me, you know, if I'm in a room with Michelle Obama, or if, you know, I'm meeting magic Johnson on a, on a remote that we're shooting, there's never a point of me. That's like, well, yeah, obviously I deserve this. I would never, I don't think I can ever get to that point where I'm just like, yeah, this is my life. Uh, thank you. Cause I think I grew up so far removed from it. So I grew up in the suburbs, my parents, none of them are in the entertainment industry. So all of this is completely foreign to me. But in LA, a lot of people grow up, you know, just in this life. So it's normal to them. But this has, even after all this time working for Conan, it's not normal to me. Even working for Conan, there's times where I'm like, oh my God, I work for Conan (laughs) O'Brien. He's so annoying sometimes, but there's still times when I'm like, what? That doesn't make sense. You grew up watching Conan as well. I think we're probably around the same age and we would get it. There was a station here called a Super Channel. Uh, way back when and that's how we, it would be a day after we get to see it but sure now everything is it's all online anyway so for the first few weeks at what point did it stop being like oh shit that's Conan O'Brien and did it just become work and you start uh, giving each other shit I know it actually happened shockingly early on <laughs> I don't know I, I don't know if that's just who he is or how he grew he grew up as one of six kids uh, and so you know, he had a lot of sibling energy around him. I had one brother and that was enough for me. Uh, and he, you know, we had a lot of sibling energy. So it almost seemed as though both of us were taking the place of our siblings. So, you know, he just immediately felt as if he could make fun of me. And I felt as if I could razz him back. And, and once we both started making fun of each other and realized there were no consequences, (laughs) we just kept going and it got worse and worse and worse. And it snowballed until a point where, you know, I started off maybe 95% professional and 5% uh, just a mess. Now it's completely flipped. Now it's like 99% of it is complete nonsense. And there's 1% where I just, I really just do good work for him. (laughs) You know, it's completely a mess. I don't know what it's like in Armenian culture, but in Irish culture, um, and I'm probably speaking out of turn here from the Irish people. I'm really not representative of the Irish people. But <laughs> it, it, it's a sign of affection. I mean, I know for me, I have two older brothers as well. It's a sign of affection when you're almost like abusive in a funny way to people. It's like, oh, that means we're on the same level here. We, we kind of like each other. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he did a DNA test recently and found out he's 100% Irish. You know, <laughs> his family's been here forever. I don't even know how you can do that. I'm not even 100% Armenian and my parents just got here, you know, within the last 50 years. So I I don't know how you do something like that, but he's, uh, I, I think it's what he does with his writers. It's what he does with me. It's what he does with his family. He, he teases us and he jokes around with us a lot and he makes fun of us a lot, but we know it's out of love. So no one is, going to sue him for it. You know, I'm not going to go to court and say, Oh, he, he said, you know, that I steal things. So every time I go out and you know, he's, he's defaming my character or I'm not going to say, Oh, you know, my dad has a mustache. So he called my dad Geppetto and said, he built (laughs) my brother out of wood. You know, I'm not going to say, Oh, for two years, he called me a vampire because he thought it sounded like I was arguing with Dracula when I was talking to my grandma on the phone, you know, like, if I go to court and say these things, they're just going to laugh at me and they're going to laugh at him. So everything that he does and jokes about is out of a place of love, but it is, I I think also now I've realized it's almost a badge of honor to see what kind of joke Conan can make about you. It's funny because that's the dynamic on the podcast, right? With you and Mac Orley as well and Conan, but you're not working directly for Conan as his assistant anymore. Like you're, I mean, you're obviously still working for Conan, but it would be yeah. strange if you were picking up his dry cleaner at this point. No, I'm not doing that anymore. I, uh, there's a guy named David Hopping who took over for me when I went on maternity leave. And David has taken over most of my responsibilities. But, you know, in the book, I talk about how I'm unfireable. So, you know, over the course of the last 13 years, I've been memorizing his social security number. I've been, you know, I've have his credit card information. I, his cell phone is under my name. You know, I, I, 
there's things that I've done and planted so that he can never get rid of me. So I'm just at this place now where I'm kind of an assistant, but not an assistant and I'm getting paid for it. So I feel like I've just fully accomplished what I set out to do from the very beginning. <laughs> so do you, do you look at yourself as, and I noticed from reading the book that you don't, but I'll ask anyway, do you look at yourself as a celebrity in any way whatsoever? Not at all. I don't, I don't, and I, I don't think there's anything that'll make you feel like less of a celebrity than working for someone who's a very big celebrity. You know, I think, I think people tend to, uh, think they're famous because, you know, they have a big following on Instagram or whatever, but then there's a different level of fame when like, you know, I'm walking around with Conan and people are staring at him and taking pictures of him and approaching him. And, uh, I, I don't think I, I will, I will never get to that point. Cause I don't want to get to that point, but I also, you know, I, I think that once the podcast ends or once Conan retires or dies, I think he'll probably die before he retires, but whatever happens, um, you know, I think I'll just slither back into obscurity and be perfectly happy with that. But what about when, I mean, the Camille Nanjani thing now is the poor guy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of feel bad for him. Like, he, he felt so you horrific. You feel bad for him? What about well, me? I had to fill in for him. Yeah, but you were great, and that's the point. So retrospectively, we can say that. And the, like it, it, all, it all went viral. So, and I mean, I love in that, in that moment as well, where you just come out, and again, you're just entirely yourself. Yeah. And I, the, the relationship around was there for everybody to see on TBS. That might be what people are respond to. What are people are interested in is there's no polish to me. I'm I'm not saying that in a way to tear myself down. I'm not a very polished person. So, you know, I come out and I just kind of talk like I normally do. Cause I don't know how to be anything else. I don't know, you know, even if there are cameras there, I don't know how to switch my persona. So I just am, I, like this is the only way I really know how to be. It really is like if on the podcast, we always joke that the way Conan and I talk to each other is exactly how we talk to each other off mic. And it's just like, they just put microphones in front of us. <laughs> that's, that's the only difference. So yeah. So not only am I, do I not have the ability to change and not be who I am, but also Conan is makes me feel very comfortable to just be myself. So I, I owe it to him too, that, you know, I didn't have to create some sort of persona or anything to just transform into when the cameras were rolling. So how does somebody sound who procrastinates so much, write a book? I don't even know. I mean, people are asking me if I'm going to write a second book and I'm like, no, it's <laughs> so much work. It's so much work. I, you know, I, I remember reading my contract and it was like 60,000 words. And I'm like, I've never written, I don't think I've written 60,000 words in my life. How am I going to write that much, you know, in this time frame that they've given it? And I had kids and I was like, I don't know what to do. So what I thought my, my whole process at that point was just put stuff on paper. It's not going to be good. Just get it down on paper and then you could fix it afterwards, which is what I did. And there's still a lot of like mistakes and stuff that I've noticed in my book, things that I've written that I kind of kept in there and I missed uh, when I was editing it. Um, but that was it. But it was so, it was the most challenging thing I think I've ever done. Cause you're right. Cause I'm at my, at, at heart, I'm just a procrastinator. But if I have a deadline, then I'm like, I guess I have to, it's how I graduated college. It was just, I knew I had to finish an assignment by a certain point. So I just waited as long as I could and then was like, okay, I can't push it off anymore. I guess I got to do this if I need to graduate. So yeah, that's, but it was hard. I don't think I'll ever do it again. So did, but did, at any point, did you enjoy it? Like, I know, because you went back and you get journals from 2010, 2011, uh, which obviously helped, they helped shape chapters. Yeah. But did you enjoy the process at all? Were you like, just need to get over this finish line. This just needs to be done. I did. You know, what's funny though, is also... I, I don't have a memory of anything that happened as soon as like, I can't tell you what we recorded yesterday on the podcast. That's like, as soon as I'm done, the headphones come off and it's almost like, as I'm taking off the headphones, the memory of everything I just talked about just goes with the headphones. I don't have an idea of anything. So it was really fun for me to go through. One of my things that I did was I went through all my old 
uh, emails. Uh, you know, every year that I had worked for him, I had them sectioned off year by year. So I would go through all of them and figure out the big things that happen. And I was like, oh, I could write something about that. I remember that. So when something triggers my memory, it's fun to write about it. So it was just, I guess the fun part was just remembering my job and <laughs> what I've done for 13 years. Where did the human centipede analogy come from? Because oh. that's when it's early on in the book and it blew my mind because it was quite visual. It is incredibly visual. I I had a diagram in there at, at first, Mike, and I'm, I had to take it out because it was a little too much. Uh, <laughs> it's incredible. Have you seen the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen, and I've seen the sequels as well. The sequels are worse. No, I see. Yeah. Somebody told me that there's like actual feces in the sequel and i said i don't need to actually see that you gotta go bigger uh, with the sequels that's it you gotta go i yeah. know but i like the implication of poop i don't need to see it so i uh i don't know how that i think that i had seen it and then we were talking about it recently and i was like this is like the entertainment industry like the guy in the front is just kind of the boss and then the person the people afterwards are his underlings and so i thought why don't i just write about it it's a very scientific approach to analyzing the Hollywood industry, I think. Um, I'm sure there are professors who are gonna analyze my approach to the human centipede theory. Um, no, it is really just silly, but it was really apt. And I think that the more I started working in the entertainment industry, the more I realized it's pretty um, it's pretty spot on. And I think that, cause, it, cause like, you realize the reason people mistreat other people that they work with is because they got mistreated. And so, you know, eventually you just have to break the centipede, you know, you have to just unsew someone's ass from or mouth <laughs> from your ass and uh, you have to like rip those stitches off. And so it was, you know, it, it, is it, I, I really, I, I don't want to say I'm proud of that section, but I think that the more I think be. about it, the more the more true it is. But it is just a very disgusting an, an, uh, analogy. It's really yeah. gross. Well, you're underlining the point that like there's so many things in popular culture and movies and TV about assistants having a horrible bosses in the entertainment industry. And yeah. I'm sure it's true of the entertainment industry as well. So the fact that you have a boss you get on very well with, you know, he's mm -hmm. got father to your kids and stuff like you, it, it sticks in people's mind. And I think it helps to stick in people's mind. I hope so. I really do. I, I hope people learn from it. <laughs> um, I thought I wanted something that wasn't anecdotal that kind of tried to talk about why my relationship with Conan is, is different than a lot of bosses have with their assistants. And I think a big part of it is because he's just a really good guy. I think that he just came from a really good family. Um, and he, when he goes home after the show, he goes home to his wife and kids and they're all very normal, very good people. And I think because he stayed humble, he's good to the people who work for him. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think I just got lucky like that. Was, was Conan hesitant in doing the podcast at first? Because I got the impression he didn't quite, I know, I remember seeing the Hollywood Reporter do the story. I've been like, this is perfect for Conan O'Brien because he just seems like he's, because I think, I think first of all, Conan's a very underrated interviewer from somebody who does it for a living. He knows when to let people breed. He knows when to come in and not all late night talk show hosts are, mm -hmm. but does that, does that make sense? It does. And I think all, you know, he's been in TV for thir over 30 years now, you know, as a writer and as a host. And I think over that time, there's a lot of things that people have brought up to him about how he's needed to kind of change with the times that he at first was like, I don't understand this. And then he becomes really good at it. So for instance, you know, when everything happened with the tonight show, his friend Sybil said, you need to start a Twitter account. And, you know, at first he was like, I don't know how to tweet. What am I going to do with a Twitter account? But then he did it. And then he sold out his entire national tour just through one tweet, you know? So, and, and then even now he's able to use it to, to continue to connect with his fans and to like, you know, continue making jokes and stuff. And then of course, when everything happened with YouTube and, you know, having, um, having a sense of like an online presence outside of the show. I think he still wasn't sure about it, but he just, he kind of just goes with the flow. And he always made this joke. Cause we had 
the show as like one entity and then the the everything with like the online presence as a separate entity and he always used to make a joke that eventually we'd all work for the online part of his business and that's exactly what happened so you know the the podcast was just kind of this organic natural nat- like natural progression for him and i think you're right i think every time i see him interview people he's really patient with them he's really good with them and that just comes from you know years and years of experience and i think before when he would have to interview someone for like six minutes now he can interview someone for 45 minutes or an hour and he can take his time and just really enjoy himself and i i I really think he he went from not being sure what the podcast was and what it was going to be to just really really loving it yeah, and I mean, I, th- I think even on the show, even on whatever iterations of Conan there's been over the years, there's still a way of interviewing people that comes across quite authentically and quite naturally. And I mean, we had Bill Burr was the first guest we had on the show a few years back. And, oh, that's so cool. And I'm a big fan. Of, I'm a huge fan of Bill's. And I'd interviewed him a few other times over the years. And Bill Burr's got that typical Irish thing where he don't, doesn't like taking compliments. You have to be just about how you're going to interview him is, is kind of tricky because you just be like, ah, just makes him, I think it just makes him cringe a little bit. Yeah, it's, it is an interesting, I have learned a lot about Irish people through working for Conan. Uh, Just how, yeah, the, the compliment part is very big. Like they almost like, it's almost as if they have to make a joke about it. As soon as you compliment them about something, like they can't just say, Oh, thank you. It's, Oh, no, 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 so, so what's coming up? Are you just taking along? Is this, is this you're going to keep doing the podcast for as long as it happens? The, the options, obviously, I mean, I would imagine it's there for, for another book. Just get a ghostwriter. You can, oh, you can just use your own. <laughs> <laughs> I think my writing style is so idiotic that I don't think that a ghostwriter would fully capture it. Uh, I think that there's, um, it's just so unprofessional. I'm not Virginia Woolf. If you guys are thinking about getting this book, just know it's not you know, I'm not like a, I'm not Jane Austen. It's just silly. It's it, there's a, it, the human centipede theory is in it for Christ's sake. Like there's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just a silly book and there's cartoons, but, um, I think that right now I'm really enjoying my time doing the pod. The podcast is so much fun. Uh, and I really love doing it. I love doing it with Conan and Matt. It's my favorite thing. It's so much fun. It doesn't even feel like work. Uh, but I'd still like to get paid for it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to say that, but it is really, really fun. Uh, and you know, the book was a really, uh, this was a new experience. I never thought in my life that I would ever write a book mainly because it's just so much work and I know myself. So I, I never thought about it, but I think ever since I started working in TV, my approach has always been, if something comes along and it sounds cool. I'll just try it out and see what happens. So, you know, that's, that's what I continue to do. I think it's what I'm always going to do. And again, until I'm just going to ride Conan's coattails until he dies. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Just, you know, suck off the Conan teeth forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when are you guys going to come to Dublin and do a, uh, do a live show in Dublin? Oh, uh, I would love to come to Dublin. The podcast is really popular. I don't that's in the email. The podcast is really popular here. I'm surprised. I, I don't know why I'm surprised, but uh, you know, he's also, he's been on the Late Late Show there and and he's got a, a good rapport with Ryan Tuberty. I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing that, but yeah, he's, you know, uh, I think Conan loves going to Ireland. I, every time he goes there, you could tell he feels like he's at home. He doesn't belong in Los Angeles. Let's be real. It's sunny here. You know, there's, there's palm trees everywhere. It's, you know, he just, he belongs in Ireland with his people. Um, I just hope he never moves there because like I said, I want to keep working for him, but hopefully soon I would love to come go to Dublin. I, I mean, if, if I had any say in it, we would go next week. Well, hope, look, hopefully that happens in the future. Sona, thanks so much yeah. for your time. This was so fun, Mike. Thank you for having me. 